So I'm Deline Pietersen. I'm from the Division for Research Development, and I'm the Manager for Research Information, and um, specifically in the Research Information and Strategy Cluster. Um, sorry, I just want to go to the next slide. Seems there's a bit of an issue there. OK. So the aim of the DHET policy when it was first introduced in the, law, in the late 80s was to um, encourage research in higher education, in the higher education sector. So that's under the aim of the policy. That is this, the specific wording as it stands in the DHET policy. So it was also to encourage research productivity and to award that via subsidy um, at all higher education institutions. And the driving force behind this policy has always been the Department of Higher Education and Training. And their definition of a research output, particular with regards to this policy, is that um, it's a textual output where and the research has to be original and it has to gain new knowledge and understanding in that particular discipline. And fundamental to this, is the fact that you have to be able to prove to them that peer review had taken place in order to ensure quality. Now, for the publication outputs, there are only three categories at the moment that qualify for subsidy. The first one, and this forms part of the bulk of the research publications that we submit for subsidy, is original research articles in accredited journals, also then original peer-reviewed books and chapters in books for experts in the field, and then published peer-reviewed conference proceedings. And then in 2019, they introduced a policy on creative outputs as well. So at the moment, we have seven lists of accredited journals. The first one is Web of Science um, that was previously owned by Thomson Reuters, and it was known as the ISI. Um, but it's been taken over by Clarovite. But the three indices that are still regarded as accredited is the Science Citation Index, the Social Sciences Citation Index, and the Arts and Humanities Citation Index. Then also, also Elsevier Scopus. Then we have ProQuest's IBSS list, and this is in particular for journals in the social, human and social sciences. Then there's also a no, so-called Norwegian list of accredited journals. Then we have the approved South African journals, and those are local journals that don't appear on any of the international indexes, um, but adhere to the criteria of an accredited journal as per the DHET policy. Then we also have the Silo SA list of local journals, and then the last index that was recently added to this list was the Directory of Open Access Journals. And there you can see the link to our website where we give you the list of accredited journals. Now, very important to note is that not all articles that appear in these journals um, will qualify for subsidy. It will only be original research articles or research letters, research papers, and then review articles that are recognized. So in other words, you know, if it's a book review, for instance, or it's a letter to the editor, it won't necessarily qual qualify for subsidy. So yes, that's the general requirements of the DHET policy, is that it has to be original research and the target audi audience has to be specialists in the relevant field. And as I've said earlier on, and we're going to stand still a bit on this aspect, is a fact of the proof of peer review that we have to provide to DHET. And just note that um, this is particular to conference proceedings and book, cha book chapters, because the assumption is that um, the journals that appear on the so-called accredited, accredited list, um, you know, those journals are all, you know, they have a very strict peer review policy in place already. So we don't have to provide any proof of peer review for articles in those particular journals. OK, so in terms of what is required from a technical perspective for publications that are submitted for subsidy, um, I'm going to break it down into the various categories. 
So for journal articles in accredited journals, we need the full length final version of the article to be uploaded on our online system. Just note that we no longer work with hard copies of, of publications. Um, the only exception is books, where we don't have an electronic copy of the book. But in all other cases, we work with the, the electronic version of the publication. And it's uploaded on our research administrator system. That's a system that is used for, for, for um, recording of, of publications. And that, in turn, is then also submitted to DHET on a system called um, ROS. That's a research output submission system that is hosted at the NRF and all higher education institutions have to upload, you know, the electronic copies of the publications on that particular system. Okay, so just a note on the final version of the article. Um, every year we come across a lot of journal articles that are uploaded on the system where it's the online first version of the article. Now, unfortunately, DHET and the auditors do not accept that version of the article. And the reason for that is simply that it could lead to double submission of the same publication. Because lots of times the online version appears months before the actual final version of the publication appears. So, you know, that could lead to, like I said, to possible double submission. So we are only allowed to, to claim for the final version of an article where a volume and an issue number had been issued. So in terms of conference proceedings, um, we have to upload electronic versions of certain information on our system that can confirm that this particular conference proceeding, you know, had appeared in a specific year. So that's why we need the copyright date, um, the ISBN information, um, the title page that can confirm, you know, the um, the name of the conference, it's where it had taken place, etc. The table of content, they also need information on the editorial board, the organizing committees, etc, etc. Um, we're going to, to send you this information. Then we also need proof of the peer review process. And in particular, um, they want proof that peer review had taken place on the full paper and not on the abstract only. And then where possible, um, you know, during our last two rounds of submission, they've also asked for reviewers' reports or reviewers' feedback on the submitted paper. Now, in terms of books and chapters in books, this is a bit tricky, you know, because the panels have come up with quite a lot of requirements in terms of what they see as adequate in order to en enable them to make an informed decision as to, you know, um, if a publication um, qualifies for subsidy. And the reason for this is also because you have to keep in mind that there's quite a lot of units at stake when it comes to, to books and chapters in books. Um, you know, a book can get up to a maximum of, of 10 units, depending on, on the number of pages in the book. So there's quite a lot of at stake when they decide whether or not to, to, to um, accredit a particular book or um, award subsidy for that. So again, you know, we have to provide them some information in terms, technical information in terms of the publication. So for books, it's either the complete electronic copy or then a hard copy of the book. And, and for chapters, again, you know, it's the same kind of information um, as for conference proceedings. And then just to stand still a bit on the proof of publication, in terms of books and chapters in books, it's very important to provide information on the pre-publication peer review process. And it has to be from the publisher. And um, we do know that sometimes, you know, that this can be an issue because the publisher is not always as close to the whole process as, for instance, the editor. So, for instance, if the editor was responsible for facilitating the process, then we need proof from the public publisher that this had been the case. Um, and in cases like that, they would accept a statement from the general editor um, when that person gives the, and that, that person then, then has to give details um, as to what the peer review process had in time, 
had entailed. Now, in terms of the information for, for this, they need the names and the affiliations of the reviewers. Unless, of course, um, you know, it was blind review, then that should be stated. It should also be stated clearly whether the peer review had taken place on the whole manuscript or in the proposal only. If possible, the peer review reports should also be provided to support the submission. Um, and then they don't accept templates or general statements in terms of peer review. Because over the years, you know, we've come across um, publications where the, the peer review process was the same for different books from different publishers. So that is no longer, you know, you can't, you can't provide a generic statement in terms of the peer review process that had been followed. And then in order to prove that independent peer review um, had taken place, if, if the editor of the book had also contributed towards a chapter or chapters in the book, then information should also be provided regarding the peer review that had taken place on the, the publications of the, of the editor. Other information, you know, um, to, to keep in mind, if you have any other reports, like for instance, peer reviews, you know, a, a book review, sorry, um, that had been published, it also helps to, to, to provide that information as well, you know, to strengthen the submission. And then in the case of second or later editions, then proof has to be provided that, um, you know, that there has been substantial reworking of the publication so that it can also be, and I think that, yeah, it's at least 50% of the publication um, should not have been published previously and should have been added onto the, the, um, the, the original publication so that it can be a standalone publication and can qualify as original new research again. In the case of dissertations and thesis, sometimes you know that they have been published as books, and um, then there must also be evidence of, of substantial reworking and additional research that had been carried out. So in a cases like that, the author should submit a detailed statement to indicate where the new work has taken place. And the original publication, in this case a dissertation or thesis, should also have been handed in. So just to give you an idea of the um, the internal process that that takes place in our office at the back end. Um, each department or entity has one person at this stage that is responsible for coordinating the process. You know, and they can set their own deadlines internally um, where information has to be provided to them so that they can submit it to us in time. We send out the notice um, for the for the opening up of the system in about August or September each year. And then the closing date for submission of publications is January of the following year. So then in February of March, we have internal screening and validation in our office um, of all the publications submitted for subsidy specifically. And then in the beginning of April, we have internal evaluation panels that look at all the submitted conferences and books in order to, to ensure that they qualify with the DHET policy requirements. Then the end of April, we have the external audit um, of all our journal articles in accredited journals. And this is a 100% audit. So um, the auditors look at all the public, all the journal articles. And um, I think this year it was in the region of about 2,700 articles that they had to audit. So it's quite a, it's quite a lot of work on their side and we don't have a lot of time, you know, to, to, to process that. So um, it takes place over a course of about five to seven working days. Um, and then, by 15 May, we have to upload all the relevant publications, as well as the additional information, as I've indicated in the previous slides, onto um, the ROS system for submission to, to DHET. And they're very strict in terms of the 15 May deadline. Um, and we have, because they, they close the system after that. And then you have to ask formally for an extension 
if you wish to upload any additional information. So December, January, or even until, you know, as late as May this year, April, May, we then receive feedback from DHET and they give us detailed feedback as to which publications they have approved for subsidy. And um, this is very important to note because um, in terms of the incentive funding, a decision was made about two to three years ago by the various subcommittees of the research committee to only approve those publications for incentive funding that had been approved by DHET themselves. So we can't allocate the SOS funds, the incentive funding, before we've received feedback from DHET. So I know this has been frustrating in some areas because in the past, um, you know, we had we had the um, we decided that we'll give incentive funding to all publications that had been submitted to DHET. But due to budget constraints and other um, you know other issues, the decision was made only to approve um, those publications that had been approved for DHET. So we have no choice but to wait for feedback from them. You know, and they have to. You know, previous years, I remember they provided us with feedback by the end of a year or even January of the following year. But nowadays, you know, it's very late in the year that we receive this feedback. So this has been put, this has put a bit of a um, delay in the, the allocation of the SOS funds. Um, in terms of the, the amount that is allocated for this incentive funding, it depends on the the various subcommittees of the research committee. Now, I know that subcommittees A and B have decided that they would allocate about 10% of the full subsidy amount for the SOS funds. Um, I know in subcommittee C, that is the, the health sciences faculty, they allocate a lesser amount, but it's because they also fund other categories of research um, and not only the incentive funding publication amount, you know. Um, in terms of this incentive funding, um, it's never paid up, paid out as some, you know, um, as an addition to someone's salary, because it can only be utilized for research and research related policy uh, activities. And there's a document um, for the spending of the, the incentive funding on our website. There's a link to that. Um, because it has to meet certain requirements um, for that money to be to be paid out. And then lastly, um, publications that were not approved by DHET based on the content of the publications can be appealed and it can only be appealed once. Um, and there's a whole process for that and you can see um, the information, the full, full process is set out in that document that we've received from DHET, um, where it explains, you know, all the information that we have to provide for that, for, for the appeals process. Um, just a short note on the issue of predatory publishing. Um, this is a very serious um, issue that we've come across over the last decade or so. Um, and, you know, you can spend a whole workshop on, the, on that, but um, this is not something that I'm going to do now. Um, I'm just going to, you know, there's just some basic details in terms of predatory publishing, the definition of that, you know, um, uh, typically what you can expect, um, it's high publishing fees with very little or no peer review. They also create false impact factors, metrics, etc. And um, this is something, or the issue of predatory publishing, you know, um, started showing up with the emergence of open access journals. So, um, you know, if you, if you wish to find out whether an open access journal is a reputable journal, you know, you can consult the directory of open access journals um, because they go through a strict review process before a journal is 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 um, taken up on that directory. But you can also consult the 
the Beals list of so-called predatory journals and publishers. Now, his list was taken down about in 2017, if I remember correctly, but there are arch archived versions of that list, and it's still a very good starting point if you wish to, to make sure you know that the journal is reputable or not. So yes, this is the end of my, my um, presentation. There's just some contact details and links to um, some of the information that I have spoken about now. And um, yes, so you're welcome if you have any questions. Thank you so much for attending this session today. Um, I'm Esmeri and I'm also in the Division for Research Development with Talian. And as you can see in my presentation, I will be presenting on the submission of creative outputs to the DHET for subsidy purposes. I've divided the presentation into two parts. First, I will look at the policy from the Department of Higher Education and Training. And then secondly, I will look at the process of submitting these outputs um, at Stellenbosch University. So, the DHET policy. The submission of creative outputs for subsidy purposes was formally included in the DHET policy on the evaluation and recognition of creative outputs and innovations after the Minister of Higher Education and Training, Mr. Blade Nzemandi, promulgated it in 2017. The policy also states the purpose as to recognize and reward quality creative outputs and innovations produced by public higher education institutions. The recognized creative outputs are divided into the following subfields, namely fine arts and visual arts, music, theater performance and dance, design, film and television, and literary arts. As part of the policy, the DHET recognizes creative outputs in those fields that you can see on the screen. And the policy also stipulates the types of outputs which may be sub submitted under each subfield as listed on the slide. So you can see there are quite a few types of outputs um, that we are allowed to submit for subsidy. And the policy has lists of criteria for each type of output to qualify for subsidy. Um, this information can be found on our website where there is a link to the policy and I will also ask Whitney to send everyone that link. The policy further stipulates that an internal review has to assess the outputs and to establish whether the outputs meet the requirements of the policy. Um, the panel has a dual purpose. It is a policy requirement for an internal panel to review outputs, and the panel is also there to advise the researchers on their submission. So you can see the panel members at Stellenbosch University on the screen, and you are more than welcome to contact them if you need assistance with submitting your creative output. I will now look at the process of submitting creative outputs. The process starts with the circulation of the call. The call is circulated via various avenues. For example, the lists, uh, there's notices on the SU website. It gets sent to all heads of departments, etc. This normally starts in December of the previous year. So for this year's submission, we started circulating the call in December 2021. Researchers can then capture their creative outputs via REDCap. The link to the REDCap survey, survey will be included in the call. Just important to note is that allowable submissions will be year N minus three. That is starting from the three years prior to the year of submission. For example, this year in 2022, we are allowed to submit outputs from 2019, 2020 and 2021. 
I would now like to highlight a few important DHET requirements which form part of the REDCap survey. The first point is the uh, requirement of a 500 to 700 word motivation. The DHET requires this motivation and they are very strict when it comes to the word count. Um, when we submit these outputs via their submission system, the system will not accept it if it's less than 500 words or more than 700 words. So the DHET need to see a written commentary by the artist to contextualize and clarify the work. The commentary should set out a brief overview of the creative output, an outline of the background information, locate the output within the discipline and demonstrate the contribution towards new knowledge, the conceptual and scholarly framework in which it should be heard or viewed. And this commentary is, is a compulsory field in the online form on REDCap. Another very important part of the submission process is the nomination of two peer reviewers. So the peer review process happens via the DHET online submission system, but the researcher needs to provide the details of two independent experts in their respective fields as part of the REDCap survey. The reviewers need to have the appropriate qualifications and or experience to assess the submissions of creative practitioners working in a scholarly framework. So peer reviewers must assess the output according to the stipulated criteria, and there's a particular focus on originality, relevance and new newness. Something else to highlight is the fact that DHET does not accept hard copies at all of creative outputs. So even in the case of books, they, we are not allowed to submit a hard copy book. It must be a link to the output. So at SU, we are fortunate that we have FixShare available that can be used as a safe platform to share a link to the output. The DHET also requires certain supporting documents as part of the submission. These documents are also uploaded by the researcher via REDCap. The documents are firstly a proof of affiliation letter that can be received from HR. Um, just note that the letter needs to confirm the year in which the output was performed. Um, secondly, they want a sign and dated declaration of originality and you must declare that it was original so it has not been published in a peer-reviewed journal or anywhere else where it received subsidy um, a declaration that the work generated has not been copied from elsewhere and a declaration of authorship or creatorship co-authorship co-creation and a disclosure of other active participants in the production of the work. Failure to declare all contributors may lead to the submission being found to be fraudulent. Um, the last documents that they require are any public profile documents. That would be things like posters that advertised the output, for example, if it was a concert or programs of the actual event or reviews in the media. OK, so what happens after the REDCap survey is completed? The captured information and supporting documents are checked by our division for completeness and then shared with the internal review panel who may suggest changes. And our department will be um, will communicate with the researcher if there are changes to be made. After this, the DRD then submits the outputs to the DHET via the online submission platform and the peer review process then starts. So the peer review process happens via the ROS um, submission platform. So the peer reviewers will receive an email from the ROS system telling them that there is an output for them to review. 
and our office also communicates with the peer reviewers to provide them with more information and how to log in to RAS and things like that. OK, with regards to the peer review outcomes, if a peer, if an output receives two positive peer reviews, the output will then be submitted for final review by the DHET appointed panels. If an output receives two negative peer reviews, it will not be submitted to DHET. If an output receives one positive and one negative peer review, we are allowed to ask for a third review. So then the DRD will make contact with the researcher to ask them for the details of a third reviewer, and we will then start the process of a third peer review via the ROS system. So we get notifications via the DHET submission site ROS. And um, for example, if a reviewer has withdrawn or if a review is completed and there's something that we need to follow up, and um, we will be notified. Um, and not the researcher. So any communication happens between our office and the peer reviewers, not the researcher and the peer reviewers. Um, the DHET also from last year requires that the internal panel should look at the positive peer review report. So even if an output received two positive peer reviews, we may still need a third review if the internal panel thinks that one of the reviews was not strong enough or there's um, something that doesn't look right, then they may ask for a third review. The final deadline for peer review is 30 September. So after this date, the DHET appointed sub panels will start looking at the outputs. They also have an in-person meeting the following year. So for this year, it will happen around February 2023, where they finalize decisions and they confirm whether the outputs will, will receive one or two subsidy units. We then receive feedback via a report. So we only get it two years after the submission. So only in 2024, we will receive the outcome of this current submission, and we then inform each head of department and individual researcher what the outcome of their submission was. Unfortunately, the DHET policy does not allow for any appeals when it comes to creative outputs, so their panel decision is the final decision. With regards to the incentive funding, as Dalian said, with the other types of research outputs, the journal articles, books, chapters, and conference proceedings, only creative outputs which were awarded DHET subsidy will receive the special support scheme funds. So the department and the researcher will be notified by our department once the funds are transferred to the department's ESA account. And the same policy applies with regards to creative outputs when it comes to the incentive funding. And I've included a link to the policy. That is the end of my presentation. Um, I'm available for any questions or you can contact me afterwards and I will also ask Whitney to send all the links that I've included in the presentation. Um, are there any questions at this time? Yes, good, good afternoon. Yes. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, I do have a few questions for, for clarification. Um, you've indicated that after the submissions of the publications, there's an internal panel that assesses the, the publications before it goes to the Department of Higher Education and Training. So yes. is, the, is the panel considered of different faculty members uh, in terms yes. of the different representations of the faculty? So that is yes. the first Okay. We have yes, we have three internal evaluation panels, um, and they are representative of the various uh, research uh, um, 
subcommittees of the research committee. And we make sure, you know, if there are submissions from a particular discipline, that there is also representatives from that discipline um, on those panels. So they're not always the same people every year, um, depending on, on the submissions that we receive. So yes, those panels are representative of the various disciplines. OK, uh, thank you for that. Um, I think two last questions. When you when when the publications are now approved by DHET, do you then when you send it to the departments for SO funds, do you specify it is for which uh, publications yes. uh, within the, the specific uh, department? And can you clarify the amount again? You mentioned 10 percent. I'm not sure I understood the 10 percent then. Yes, so on the system where the publications are recorded, you know, it's recorded on an individual level. So the person that's responsible within your department for capturing the information, they have access to all kinds of reports from the system. And when we send out the letters to the heads of department to indicate, you know, that SOS funds had been paid into to their S account, we also indicate to them um, to ask this representative to withdraw this so-called subsidy report from our online system. And that then gives um, information on an individual basis as to which publications qualify or what, which publications, you know, um, had been awarded subsidy, as well as the number of units in question. Now, at the moment, the um, the rand value of a unit is just over 12,000 rand for subcommittees A and B. And for subcommittee C, um, that's the the health, the medical sciences. Esmeri, is that seven or 9,000 per unit? Is it 8,000? Okay, that's 8,000 rand per unit. So for the other two, the, the, the social sciences as well as the natural sciences, that's 12,000, I think 789, if I remember correctly, per unit. Does that answer your question? Yes, yes, it does. Thank you for clarifying that. And if it's a co-authorship, is it still the same units? Look, it depends on, um, say for instance, it's a journal article in an accredited journal and there are two authors and one author is at Stellenbosch University, then that is 0.5 units. So the number of units allocated to a publication is always divided between the number of authors. Um, I can send you the formulas for that. It's in the DHET policy document as well. Um, but I, if, if you need more information, I can I will gladly supply with the with the subsidy units and the calculation of that. 